NCIS is going down under in NCIS Sydney. Follow a multinational task force as they get on the case in the new series. In the CBS original, American NCIS agents team up with the Australian Federal Police to keep naval crimes in check. The Americans and Aussies must learn to trust each other and overcome their differences in order to solve each case. Stream new episodes of NCIS Sydney now on Paramount+. Plus. Head to ParamountPlus.com to try it free. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Parts of the following are from the book Presumed Guilty by Stephen Singular. On June 17, 2016, the Boulder Police Department arrested Gary Oliva, age 52, for uploading 20 or more images of graphic child pornography to a Google email address. Google then sent a cyber tip to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children forwarded on to the Boulder Police Department via the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Some of the images showed a girl thought to be between four and seven engaged in sexual acts with an adult male whose face could not be seen. Oliva, a homeless registered sex offender, had been arrested in Boulder in 2000 for possession of marijuana and a stun gun a weapon that veteran homicide investigator Lou Smith believed had been used on John JonBenet Ramsey on the night of her death in Boulder in late 1996. When arrested in 2000, Oliva was carrying a photograph of the victim in a poem entitled Ode to John JonBenet. Several media outlets report that Colorado inmate Gary Oliva has confessed to murdering John Bonet numerous times, but has never been charged. Gary Oliva has a history of violence and has been convicted of several sex abuse offenses, including first degree rape. While in prison, Gary draws pictures of John Bonet and writes letters to those on the outside, requesting that they send him pictures of the little girl who is forever frozen in time at the young ages of just four, five, and six years old, in dozens, if not hundreds, of images available on the internet. Gary penned the following letter about JonBenet Ramsey to an old friend while passing time during a stay at the Boulder County Jail. The letter reads, My heart was split, and a flower appeared, and grace sprang up, 
and it bore fruit for my God. You split me, tore my heart open, filled me with love. You poured your spirit into me. I knew you as myself. My eyes are radiant with your spirit. My nostrils fill with your fragrance. My ears delight in your music, and my face is covered with your dew. Blessed are the people who are planted on your earth, in your garden, who grow as your trees and flowers grow, who transform their darkness to light. Their roots plunge into darkness. Their faces turn toward the light. There is infinite space in your garden. All people are welcome here. All they need do is enter. I love you, John Bonet. It would be worth it to take the blame for you. At the center of the letter is a very accurate pencil sketch of John Bonet. Gary was in his early 30s when John Bonet was killed. And some records indicate that he was living at an address located approximately just 0.3 miles from the Ramsey household where John Bonet slept that infamous night. That is just a six minute walk from door to door or from door to point of entry. And of course, even faster if one were to run and cut through yards. Gary Howard Oliva has an estimated mandatory release from prison scheduled for March of 2024. This is True Crime Garage. When you talk about the John Benet Ramsey case, there is a suspect that just will not go away. And for good reason. Suspicion levels run high with this one, Captain, and we will get into some of the arguments for why Gary Oliva is a great suspect and also the reasons why maybe he is not such a great suspect in the still yet to be solved, never an arrest made or charges brought forth in the soon to be 27 year old homicide case of little six year old Boulder, Colorado beauty pageant winner. The one we called Little Miss Christmas, John Benet Ramsey. Seems now, all of these years later, so hard to believe that John Benet, who, as we said in today's trailer, seen all of those pictures that we all have seen over the years of her at home with family or in one of those many beauty pageants. She is forever frozen in time to the young age of just five or six years old. She would have been in her early 30s today, maybe even celebrating Christmas with a child or children of her own this year. And with many famous cases, and some could argue that this is the most famous true crime case of all time, there's confessions. There are several confessors. And let's start off our timeline with this particular suspect and how he relates to the Jean Benet Ramsey case. Right. So first the suspect that will not go away obviously is Gary Oliva. There are many news outlets and online stories still this year in 2023 coming out about Gary and his potential ties to the Jean Benet case. According to the sun, Gary Oliva's fixation with John Bonet began decades ago. He first landed on the radar of private detectives working for John Ramsey in the spring of 1997 after someone from the district attorney's office called John Ramsey to alert him to a tip the Boulder Police Department had received about Oliva. Okay, so to break this down a bit, Jean Benet is killed either very late on Christmas night or very likely sometime before 5.52 a.m. 
Mountain Standard Time, Thursday, December 26, 1996. Very quickly, Boulder Police Department sets up a tip line. Call in. Let us know if you have seen anything, heard anything, or know who is responsible for this little girl's death. But almost simultaneously, Boulder Police Department is also becoming very suspicious of the persons in the house. Maybe John, Patsy, or both were responsible or involved in the death and cover-up of John Bonet. What it appears that they did was to start the heavy focus on John and Patsy. So while they have this tip line, a phone line for people to call in, I believe that the actions of the Boulder Police Department, or the lack thereof, will strongly suggest that unless your tip or your information was about the Ramseys, they were not going to waste their time following up on the tip. So possibly knowing this in the spring of 1997, someone from the district attorney's office called John Ramsey to alert him to a tip the Boulder Police Department had received about Gary Oliva. However, this is after receiving two tips about Gary Oliva. The tip concerned information shared by a one Michael Vale, who is up front and center on the internet. You can Google his name, you can search engine Gary Oliva, and you're going to find Michael Vale. You're going to see him conducting interviews and being asked questions about his friend, Gary Oliva. Yeah, quote unquote friend. And Michael has been basically the spearhead since 96, waving the red flag saying, you guys need to look into Gary. Yeah, and so Michael Vale. He doesn't live or did not live in Boulder back then. He didn't even live in Colorado for that matter. He lived in a nearby state. So he calls the tip line regarding a phone call that he said that he had received from Gary Oliva the night prior. In that phone call, Gary claimed to have harmed a little girl in Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. So some reports state that Michael Vale, who, according to Michael, maybe Gary Oliva's best friend or very good friend from high school. Some reports state that Michael called the tip line on December 27th, 1996. So this would be the day after John Bonet's lifeless body was removed from the Ramsey home. According to those reports, Michael stated in the police tip that he was concerned because Gary calls him the day before. So this would be right after the murder. He says in the phone call, Gary is crying, and he said he would never be able to go to Michael Vale's house again. Why? Because Michael, his friend, has children. According to Michael Vay, quote, the phone call started with him, meaning Gary, sobbing into the phone. Mm -hmm. He related to me that he had done something horrible. He mentioned he was in Boulder. The call, Michael says, came just after John Benet Ramsey's murder. Gary told him he had hurt a child. Quote, he was sobbing like you've never heard a grown man sob or cry before in your life, and I knew this was very serious, end quote. Again, the man he was calling about was Gary Oliva. Who is Gary Oliva? Well, he's a convicted sex offender from Oregon who made frequent trips to Boulder. According to police records, back in 1991, months after Gary sexually assaulted a seven-year-old girl, Gary tried to strangle his mother with a telephone cord. Now fast forward to December 1996, the month that John Bonet is murdered, Gary Oliva is reported to be a fugitive and a homeless drifter who was in Boulder, Colorado and has ties to and may have even been about a block away from the Ramsey home. Yeah, some people say that he was 13 houses away. Yeah, that's I, that's the trouble with the information about Gary Oliva. Mm -hmm. You'll read some of these reports, and these are coming from online articles and from newspaper articles. Some will say 14 houses away, 13 houses away, 10 buildings away. I've even seen eight. Uh, I went on there and tried to count them. The difficult thing is, you, you kind of got to go down the street and make a turn. So depending on which way you want to count them, right? you can make it seem as close as you want. Distance-wise, it's 0.3 miles. So roughly a six-minute walk. And the thing here that we should be kind of clear about is what is unclear is if he was actually living at 
that building or that facility because there's actually two buildings there and we'll get into that here in a bit but some of the following is from cbs and 48 hours investigates remember ollie gray we talked about him a little bit last week ollie gray an investigator who worked for the ramses for many years says that gary frequented buildings owned by a local church which fed homeless people the buildings according to this report were just 10 houses away from the Ramsey house. Boulder Police Department investigators never responded to Michael Vale's tip. They never called him back to get further information, and he reported the call for a second time three months later. So when he doesn't hear anything back from his first tip, he's very concerned. He still sees that there's an ongoing investigation going on on TV. He calls back Hey, I called in this tip. I have all this information that I believe is important to your investigation, important to the murder of this little girl. Nobody called me back. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked for more information. And he says that when he called back the second time, three months later, again, he was met with silence. When you hear Michael's story, I think it's more chilling when you find out that his communication with Gary was not over the phone normally. And so this call was pretty much out of the blue and it it was the first time he talked to him in years so you get a phone call from this guy that you once knew they say quote unquote friend but Gary was more of a acquaintance they went to a very small school so everybody knew everybody and now you got this guy from your high school calling you that and they used to call him scary Gary was his nickname and scary Gary's on the phone crying and telling you he he hurt a child. I mean, you want to talk about an intense phone call. And the only reason why he was able to put together any link to the John Bonet Ramsey case was, you know, Gary is from Oregon. So he started asking him questions. And the more answers he got from Gary, Gary was then catching on to the fact that that Michael was trying to get information from him and then disconnects the phone call. So after this second tip comes into the hotline and once again, not followed up on that is when quote, someone at the DA's office and quote passes this tip to John Ramsey's team of attorneys and private investigators. I have my suspicions here, captain. We just mentioned Ollie gray. And last week, we spent a lot of time talking about the late, great master detective, Lou Smith. We briefly discussed Ollie Gray with John Anderson. But who is Ollie Gray and why, like Lou Smith, is he so important to this case? Well, Lou Smith was not the first investigator to work for the Boulder District Attorney's Office trying to build a case against the Ramseys and then decided to quit. And then later, I don't know if I would say Lou Smith teamed up with John Ramsey, but he certainly went to that side of the argument. Right. So the short of it is Lou Smith is brought in to investigate the murder of John Bonet. That's what he's told. Once he gets there, He's seeing the situation very differently. He's seeing, oh, I was brought in to build a case against the Ramseys, Mm -hmm. not really to investigate the case. And once he says, look, the evidence isn't leading me to your theory or to what you believe has happened here, I can no longer in good faith work for your office. Well, he's actually following the trail that was blazed by a one Ollie Gray. So Ollie Gray, same situation. He's a private investigator working for the DA's office, Boulder, Colorado DA's office. Later, he quits, and then he goes and joins, he officially joins John Ramsey's investigator team, private investigator team. And what I think is so important there, we sit here, a thousand miles away from this case, Mm -hmm. almost 27 years after the fact, there's so much flim flam crapola 
on the internet and even in respectable, reputable newspapers about this case. It makes it very difficult for two guys in a garage. Two handsome guys. Experts we may be in some kind of level of true crime having done 700 episodes. Mm -hmm. 10 million if you include all the the off-the-record episodes. (laughs) It's but, a million and one. That's right. But uh, the thing here is it gets difficult for any true crime buff to look at this. Any armchair sleuth, basement detective, whatever you want to call us, to look at this case and go, well, I can, if, you, if you can do that and you tell me that you know what happened here and who's responsible, I will tell you you are a damn fool. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to point out here is that investigators with more expertise, more experience, and more know-how than anybody, any detective at Boulder Police Department, when they were brought in to see things and investigate this case and get paid to do it up front and center, both of those detectives walked away from the Boulder District Attorney's Office because they were not building a case against the Ramseys. So I think it's important to go, look, these experts who, look, we, we are, nobody's perfect. Every human is flawed in some way. They could be wrong too. But the ones that were at the center of this case that know far more than any of us ever will know or uncover in our entire lives walked away and went and joined the other team. So, Again, what did the Boulder Police Department do with this tip that came in from Michael Vale? They did nothing. Why nothing? Well, according to Lou Smith, the Boulder Police didn't follow up on 95% of the more than 3,000 phone tips that came in. 3,000 phone tips come in, and according to this detective, who is much more religious than the captain and I, Mm -hmm. he says... 95% of these tips were not followed up on by Boulder Police Department. In Gary Oliva's case, police didn't investigate him until nearly four years after John Bonet's death. That is when Gary was arrested in Boulder in 2000 for possession of marijuana and a stun gun. When arrested in 2000, Oliva was carrying a photograph of John Bonet Ramsey and a poem entitled Ode to John Bonet. Of course, most know when reviewing Lou Smith's intruder theory, one of the aspects of that case that he was looking into was the possibility that a stun gun caused two yet to be identified marks left on the victim. So that was back in 2000, but Gary can't stay out of trouble. In 2002, he was wanted in the state of Oregon for probate for probation violations. He turned himself into Boulder police. His words in 2002 He claims he never used that stun gun on a child. He says he did not hurt or kill John Bonet. When asked whether he told his friend that he was attracted to little girls, he said, quote, I don't want to talk about that. Sounds like a mission of guilt there. Yes, exactly. But it's also tough in this case because the Boulder Police Department, we we both, I think, lean towards the idea that they came up with their theory that the parents were involved when the parents are the murderer of this girl. Now we have to build the case around this conclusion. Mm -hmm. And that's not how this is supposed to work. You're supposed to follow the evidence and the evidence leads you to a conclusion. But I also don't fault people. Some of the comments that we got about the Lou Smith episodes were, well, he had this, tight relationship with John Ramsey. So therefore that would be, that would hinder him able to look at this uh, with an unbiased lens. And I, and I'd argue that I think they're correct. I think any relationship that you have with the, the parents would on some level Make your thoughts biased. Yeah, and this relationship, if if we want to call it that, it, it develops to that at some point later, much later. And as we talked about last week, Lou Smith was unfortunately at uh, Patsy Ramsey's deathbed. And the thing here, though, that I think we need to keep in mind a couple of things. 
I, I'm with you fully, Captain. I'm with the listeners out there that brought up that fine point. Yes, it, it could easily cloud one's vision and judgment when you develop some kind of respect or relationship with the parents of a dead child. The other thing, though, too, is keep in mind, Lou Smith tells his good friend John Anderson when he's asked, when he's hired by Boulder District Attorney's Office, he says, well, this probably won't take very long. The The parents are, one of the parents are probably guilty here. This is before he's seen any of the evidence. Right. He's telling his good friend that, uh, yeah, I'll go down, because Lou Smith's wife was terminally ill at that time. She was unfortunately in the process of dying herself and he was very committed to his wife and a couple of his friends say really you're going to go out of town and take this job out of town when your wife probably needs you here but this guy felt that he had a that he had a duty and a responsibility to these victims so strong that he was willing to take time away from his wife to go down to boulder and investigate this case And I firmly believe what Lou was telling his friends at the time. He didn't think it was going to take very long because he's read the, he's read the newspapers. He's read and seen what's being on the news right here where every talking head out there is saying, Oh, this is an open shut case. One of the, one of the family members did it. One of the parents did it. And so he walks away that valuable time with his wife to go down and investigate it. And what does the evidence tell him? The evidence he's seeing is he's finding evidence to support a possible intruder theory. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. For many of us, we are approaching the gift-giving season. Whether or not your family gives gifts during the holidays, you get to define how you give to yourself. And the holidays are a great time to do that. So whether it's by starting therapy, going easier on yourself during the tough moments, or treating yourself to a day of complete rest, remember to give yourself some love this holiday season. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. If you're a parent and you want to help your child get better grades this year, but you don't want to pay for costly tutors, then IXL is right for your family. IXL is an online learning program for kids. IXL covers math, language arts, science, and social studies through interactive practice problems from pre-K to 12th grade. IXL even has skill plans for specific textbooks. As kids practice, They get positive feedback, awards, and clear explanations when they get questions wrong. Plus, as your kid uses it, the IXL program figures out what your kids need more help with and adapts to recommend more topics to practice. Save time and money. One subscription gets you everything, and all memberships start at only $9.95 a month. See why one in four students and the U.S. are learning with IXL. IXL can tackle all of your kids' specific needs, whether it's struggling with the subject, trying to keep up with class, trying to get ahead, or studying for a test. Plus, the videos learned by example paired with each question and explanations are all especially helpful. Plus, you'll save time. Leave it to the experts, I say. Leave it to IXL to help you out. Now is the time to get IXL. Our listeners can get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when they sign up today at IXL.com slash garage. Visit IXL.com slash garage to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price.
If you've been wanting to learn a new language because you want to connect more with family members whose native language isn't English or because it could make you a more competitive job applicant, then Rosetta Stone is for you. Rosetta Stone is the most trusted app out there. It will fast track your language acquisition because lessons are immersive. They're designed to teach you to pick up languages in a natural way. Choose from one of 25 languages. Plus, with Rosetta Stone's true accent feature, you'll get feedback on how well you're pronouncing words. Rosetta Stone is convenient. It can be used on desktop or as an app, and lessons are as short as 10 minutes. Plus, it's an incredible value, especially compared to pricey tutors. A good friend of mine is learning German. Why? Because his ancestry. He wants to learn more about his family's history and connect with extended family members. So he is using Rosetta Stone to learn German. And he's told me that Rosetta Stone has made it fast and easy on his journey. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. And Rosetta Stone makes the perfect holiday gift. For a very limited time, True Crime Garage listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. That's 50% off Unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash garage today. Did you know that according to FBI data, break-ins and property thefts spike this time of year? Burglars just love taking advantage of people traveling for the holidays. That's why Simply Safe's Home Security is offering a holiday deal of up to 50% on any new system so you can stay safe this season. Simply Safe is comprehensive protection for the whole home with advanced sensors that not only detect break-ins but fires, floods and other threats to your home. Simply Safe's Video Doorbell Pro and wireless outdoor security camera are a powerful way to deter package thieves. It's powered by 24/7 professional monitoring for less than $1 a day, half the cost of traditional home security. Satisfaction is backed by Simply Safe's money back guarantee. Try Simply Safe for 60 days risk free. If you don't love it, return your system for a full refund. We've all seen the movie Home Alone, so we know the holiday season is also break in season. Give yourself the gift of peace of mind. Give your family and pets the gift of a home that feels like the safest place on earth. Some people travel for the holidays, and what better way? to keep an eye on your property and home this year while away than with Simply Safe. This holiday season, protect your home and family with Simply Safe. And for a limited time, you can save up to 50% on any new system with a fast protect plan. Visit simplysafe.com slash garage. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. There's no safe like Simply Safe. All right, welcome back to the garage. Cheers, everybody. Onward and upward. Cheers to the people in the back. Cheers to all the people that left comments on Instagram and Twitter or X or whatever Elon Musk is calling it these days about last week's episodes with John Anderson and as they relate to the John Bonet case. It, we know we did our six parter and we proudly re released that in the garage refill most Christmases because we're very proud of those episodes, but this case is so big and we really wanted to spend some time looking at some different aspects that we were not able to dig into, but also to get some others to come in who have some expertise in this case, right? some direct involvement in this case and just ask them, what did they witness? What did they learn about this? What are their thoughts and opinions on the case? and get some outside perspective. So thank you to John Anderson for joining us last week. You want to talk about outside perspective? Remember when Gary Oliva is, when he's arrested, he says, when asked, are you attracted to little girls? He says, I don't want to talk about that. That was a quote, direct quote. Yeah. I don't want to talk about that. Well, Gary doesn't want to talk about that, but we will. 
So let's go way back, back before the murder of John Bonet. Again from CBS, Michael Vail, Gary's good friend from high school, says that after high school, Michael and Gary thought a fun way to keep in touch would be through the use of audio tapes. Mm -hmm. So Michael and Gary would each record something on a cassette tape and then send it to the other one to listen to. That's how the captain and I spent our time before the creation of podcast. So Michael says <laughs> that the tapes, tapes was that making tapes and sending them to each other. So Michael says that the tapes were just kind of this goofy thing that they did. Right. Right. Like Michael saying that he would go to Carl juniors. I think that's a fast food joint, right? So he'd go to like a Carl juniors and interview someone there and then send the cassette tape to Gary. Right. Gary would do things like going to a grocery and pretending to interview a cookie. You know, so kind of fun, creative, goofy stuff. Right. But according to Michael, in 1989, Aliva's tapes changed dramatically and the tapes started getting dark and then depraved and even went beyond that. They got sick. They got yeah. sicker. Michael says some of the stuff would turn his stomach saying that on one tape, Gary was pretending to be babysitting a friend's daughter. Yeah. On one tape, Gary talks about raping a little girl. On that same tape, simulating a rape. Yeah. On another tape, Gary talks about hurting a child. Listen to this quote from Michael saying, Gary said on one tape, quote, some of the things I do, like making bacon strips out of little girls, you see, I'm into it, you know, end quote. So Michael says these tapes got very strange, very disturbing, starting in 1989. Now let's go to 1990, when Gary gets arrested for molesting a seven-year-old girl. In the police report complaint, the little girl says Gary touched her butt and in her vaginal area three different times while showering with the little girl. This little girl was left alone with Gary. Now, I have Gary Howard Oliva's birthday as 1964. My state school math tells me that old Gary is about 26 years old when these incidents occurred. Now, I'm not victim blaming here, and I'm guessing there are others that have regrets about this whole situation. The captain and I, while different people, in many ways, we are very much the everyman. So sort of everyman splaining here to the ladies. I can say with 100% confidence as a man, as a grown man who has lived through and thrived even in my 20s, no regular guy wants to have or hang out with a kid that is not his or related to him. It's boring and it's annoying. And definitely not hang out with a child in a shower. Exactly. If, if you do not have to pay or beg a guy at that age to watch your kid or to be left alone with them, then there's probably something wrong with that dude. That is probably not a normal guy. Mm -hmm. We've reviewed too many of these cases where after a rape, molestation, weird photos were taken of a kid or kids, and the parent or guardian is saying, I left her with a neighbor. He always seemed like a nice guy. I left her or him with my brother's best friend who I had met three or four times. I thought it would be okay. Nope. If a regular guy really doesn't want to spend time with your kid that he doesn't know. Yeah. Adam Carolla used to have a joke that when they asked for chaperones for a school event, whoever raised their hands first, you have to eliminate. Ex and yeah. it's, it's the guy that is begging you not to be it, the guy that begs you not to be a chaperone is the guy that you actually want to be a chaperone. That's the thing. Like Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, all those things. You investigate all the problems and the issues organizations like that had, and you realize very quickly, wait a second, there's grown men with no children of their own involved in this organization volunteering large amounts of their time. Those are the people they always end up having problems with. Well, and it's not saying that there's not good people that want to leave a good mark on society, but that's a very, very small percent. Of very those, small. Those there, people. There's a higher number of people that want to do bad things to kids. And that's why they position themselves around children. Yeah. Okay. So that was 1990. Now we go to the next year, 1991 in May of 91, Gary Oliva is arrested for attempting to strangle his mother with a telephone cord 
This is in Oregon. According to the police records obtained by the U.S. Sun, during the course of the attack, Gary threatened his mom, warning, quote, I should have killed you a long time ago. He also stated when the sheriff arrives, they will find you dead. Oliva removed a butcher knife from the drawer and had it in his possession. The, the report reads, Oliva also pulled a telephone cord loose from a telephone. Back in the day, young listeners, we had phones that hung on the wall mm-hmm. in our Connected houses. Connected by cords. And they would have a cord. And he pulls this cord out from the telephone, wraps it around his mother's neck, and he begins pulling it tight. It makes you wonder if there was some kind of abuse towards Gary as a child, or maybe there's there was a, a, a sexual abuse towards Gary that maybe his mother knew about but didn't do anything about. Um, really begs the question of when he says, I, I should have killed you a long time ago. Oliva ran off before police arrived, but was later caught and jailed for 17 months. In 1996, John Benet Ramsey is killed, and then on a cold December night, marking one calendar year since John Benet's murder, dozens of mourners showed up for a candlelight vigil outside the Ramsey home. One man present there that night was of interest to the keen eye of the master detective, Lou Smith. That face in the crowd was Gary Oliva. Quote, many times. Criminals do return to the scene, and that was on the anniversary. That puts him right there at the Ramsey house a year later, end quote, says Lou Smith. December 12, 2000, Oliva is arrested on the University of Colorado campus on charges of criminal trespass, drug possession, and possession of a weapon by a prior criminal offender. At the time of his arrest, Gary was found with a stun gun in his possession in addition to a photograph of John Bonet and a poem he had written about her. In 2002, Lou Smith told CBS 48 Hours that Oliva may have been part of a group of several men who broke into the Ramsey home. Now, also in 2002, CBS News reports that police said Oliva is not a suspect. Sources say his DNA doesn't match evidence at the scene, end quote. Make special note of that because we will circle back to that as we go. From a 2004 interview, Gary Oliva claims he doesn't remember making the disturbing audio tapes, the ones that Michael Vale says that he received from Gary. Yeah, they, they just magically were created. What he will admit to is an obsession with John Bonet and claims to have a problem being around young girls. Well, that's a polite way of saying it. Mm -hmm. Oliva told 48 Hours, I believe she, meaning John Bonet, I believe she came to me after she was killed and revealed herself to me. Mm. Strange. We do need to point out here, and I, I don't love this statement, It's been reported that Gary has been classified as a paranoid schizophrenic. Right. I don't know why they chose to use the word classified rather than diagnosed. So I don't, I don't love that statement, but I've seen it several places. Mm -hmm. In June of 2016, Gary is arrested on child porn charges. Now, look, I get it. We, 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 I get this, I get this tweet or a message Almost every time that we cover one of these child cases, unfortunately, we, we, we got these child cases that, that we have to discuss. We have to keep them alive. We have to keep them people talking about them so they can eventually be the predator can be found. You got to smoke out that evil. And I get it that people want to call it child sex abuse material. There's different, there's all kinds of different terms being thrown around these days. And I think that's fantastic. You are spot on. That's probably what it should be called. I agree. But here in the garage, we tend to call things what the charges would be once the perpetrator is in court facing the charges. Yeah, so we didn't create... That term is child pornography. Right. We didn't create that term. We're just using the term that law enforcement uses. And people like to say, look, Nick, when you say pornography, that's suggestive that the, the child 
was a partic- a willing participant. Right. We're not suggesting that at all. Not at all. In fact, actually, the word child, when applied in that phrase, it it implies a child doesn't even have the ability to consent as far as the the law goes. Right. So just having the word child in there means that there is no consent by the victim. So let's go through these charges real quick here, Captain. Boulder Police, the same agency investigating the Ramsey case, said that they arrested Gary Oliva. He was approximately 52 years of age at that time. This was after getting that cyber tip that we talked about in the trailer from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Kudos to them. That Look, look at this. Th- this is agency, this foundation put together by the Walsh family, doing its job here, doing good work, pulling this sex offender off the streets. They were the ones that discovered this crime taking place. They are the ones that notified the Boulder Police Department. Court documents in this case show that Aliva downloaded 22 separate sexually explicit images. All of the photos show children under the age of 10. This from someone at Boulder PD says, we certainly understand the interest in Mr. Oliva, both in connection with the new charges and his possible connections in the past. So this is a statement they are referring to in 2016, these new charges, this new arrest, people were coming out of the woodwork going, Hey, Hey, wasn't this guy a suspect in the Ramsey case? And this is somebody at the Boulder PD saying, we're aware of this guy. Mm -hmm. we're aware of the new charges and we're aware of his possible connection to the case in the past. The documents show that he downloaded the child pornography from an IP address that was very similar to where he was registered as a sex offender in October of 2015. So that has to be bolder because that's the agency that the national center for missing exploited children contacted when they received this information. Now, nearly two decades after John Benet Ramsey was killed inside her family's Boulder home, a suspect in the infamous Christmas night murder is behind bars accused of downloading child pornography. That was one of the subtitles for some headlines that were popping up in 2016 after this arrest. Quote, we haven't ruled him in or out in connection with the Ramsey case, said Sarah Huntley, a spokesperson for the city of Boulder. What? What? How can you say in 2004 to CBS News, Mm -hmm. we're not interested in this guy. He doesn't match the DNA at the crime scene. And then in 2016, a direct quote from the city of Boulder, spokesperson with the city of Boulder, we haven't ruled him in or out in connection with the Ramsey case. It can't be both. I think it becomes more complicated the more tests they did on the DNA the, and as science catches up, there is some kind of mixture with the DNA and a lot of people believe that the DNA has been compromised because the crime scene was so compromised. Exactly. And I, and I don't want to talk about it too much. I don't want to stay on this topic too much longer, Captain, unless, unless you want to. Mm-hmm. Because I'm worried that by speaking about it too long, we're going to will it into existence, right? Is there a problem with this DNA? Right. So let's not talk about that too long. But let's talk about the idea that there could have been two persons responsible in some form or fashion. And it's very difficult for a detective who's investigated 200 homicide cases to pick up a guy and find a stun gun on him, a picture of your victim, a poem about the victim. You review his background and he's got first degree rape charges against a seven year old girl. John Bonet was six years old going on seven. These, these, most of these guys have a type, right? They have a certain age group that they like. Age is very important to them. And the high school friend that Gary was making contact with Michael says that he knew that Gary had a fascination with six year olds. Here's the thing, captain. 
Here's something that did not happen in this investigation. Why? Mm. Because the, the, the men and women working for the Boulder Police Department didn't have enough experience in this realm, in this world, in this sick, depraved world of child sex murder. And that's not their fault. Good for them. I hope and pray that all of us never have to deal with this directly. But here's the thing. They were, they were inexperienced and what they did not do in this case is something that, you know, your old garage guys would be doing the old pervert roundup. It didn't happen in this case. In this case, if this were my case and if this were the captain's case, you better believe your ass Mm -hmm. that we would be doing the old pervert roundup. And guess what? If I find anybody, any registered sex offender that has, that knows the Ramseys or has direct contact or even worked for John Ramsey, you just went to the top of my list. I'm going to be at your door with a uniformed officer and a detective and your parole officer knocking at 6 a.m. December 27th. You'll be at the top of the list. It was determined that there had been more than 100 burglaries in the Ramsey's neighborhood in the months leading up to John Bonet's murder. If you look at Gary, it's it's not just the fact that he has a, a obsession almost with six year old girls, but he he's a he's known to break into houses. So is he responsible for any of these break-ins? The other thing, too, that gets lost in the sauce a lot of times when we talk about these crimes and what people are capable of, look, a, a, a pedophile and a molester are not the same thing. Not all pedophiles molest or rape children. And not all child rapists are, are technically pedophiles. And I don't want to go down that road too far. Uh, There's a lot of investigating and learning and education out there on that subject. But not just the burglaries, Captain. Here's what else was determined. There was 38 registered sex offenders living within a two-mile radius of the Ramsey home. Yeah, and you want to round all those up. Yep. You You need to be able to count them in or out. And once you're able to do that, then you could start looking at other individuals and it moves very quickly. You can move very quickly through these 38, this list of 38, you show up to somebody's door and they're not there. They're in trouble. They're in trouble. Mm -hmm. If they're, if they're not, if they've left the state for any reason, they're in trouble. They may not have killed John Bonet, but they're in trouble with their parole officer. If they've not notified this, their officer in charge, the other, like I said, I the at the top of my list would be finding one of these thirty eight that has that knows John Ramsey or may even have worked for him at one time. If 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 I cross reference those two lists and there's one name on on both of them, that's the door I'm knocking on first, and then after that, I'm starting with the closest registered sex offender to the Ramsey home proximity wise, and then fanning out from there. So listen to this, Captain. In 2001, we we don't have to go down the road of the heavy focus against the Ramseys. That's been well reported by everybody, their brother and their cousin. In 2001, former Boulder County prosecutor Trip DeMuth and Boulder County Sheriff's Detective Steve Ainsworth stated that there should be a more aggressive investigation of the intruder theory. This is in relation to that more than 100 burglaries in the neighborhood and 38 registered sex offenders within a two mile radius of the Ramsey home. As we all know, Lou Smith is convinced that a pedophile came into the Ramsey home and killed the Ramsey's daughter. Lou Smith said, quote, I've probably got 25 good leads and I probably have another 50 pages of other leads to follow. Among the files that Lou Smith kept on local sex offenders in Boulder, Colorado, Gary Oliva's name stood out to Lou Smith. Michael Vale believes that Oliva may have broken into the Ramsey's home several times. Michael says he left all of this information, everything he knew at the time on the Boulder police tip line. He says, I told them about the cassette tapes. 
I told them about the phone call. No one from the police called me. No one called and asked to listen to any of those tapes. I had mentioned handwriting samples. He had received letters from Gary. He says, I don't know what it's worth, but I thought, here's a lead that you might want to follow up on. You know, he's back then in 96, he wasn't saying my friend killed this little girl. He's just saying, I got this information. You might want to look into it. He says, I know this weird fellow that's in Boulder, Colorado. I left all that information about the tapes, the handwriting, the phone call. I called them and I told them that. And no one from the police department ever called and asked about any of the information I left. Again, it goes back to that they already came to their own conclusion. So anything that doesn't fit that narrative, they just didn't look at. And and it's just irresponsible. I think what's interesting, too, about Gary being a suspect, I mean, you go back to the initial call to Michael the, the night or the day after JonBenet Ramsey is killed and he's claiming that he hurt a little girl. He was also known in high school to break into places and steal art supplies because he was an artist. Yeah, and you can see by the letter that we discussed in the trailer or the poem that we discussed in the trailer, he draws a a, a pretty good, a very accurate depiction of John Bonet there. And so he is either schooled or practiced in at least drawing. And it's very interesting here. So known according to Michael Vale that he broke into places and stole art supplies amongst other things. I'm sure there were other items that he probably stole, not just looking strictly for art supplies on these break-ins. But what really strikes a nerve with me here, captain is when I hear that and then compound that with all the information we already know, right? So we're not saying Gary Oliva killed John Bonet. We are not saying that we know who did. We are also not saying that 100% the intruder theory is absolutely right. No. But what we are saying is we want to investigate and look at the totality of everything in this case. And, you know, when we talk to John Douglas, legendary retired FBI profiler, John Douglas, the mind hunter, he said to us, you know, guys, you profile the, the likely offender. You profile the victim, you profile the location, and you profile the circumstances. You have to incorporate that all into your thoughts and your direction of who you think did that particular crime. So we are trying to look at the totality of everything here and present it to you, not just the victim, not just the parents, not just some sexual predator or sex offender that lived nearby, but the totality of everything that was going on in that city at that time, because we don't know what is relevant and what is not relevant until we look at each detail of this case. Well, I think that's an important thing to, to point out. I think a lot of individuals that have listened to our six part series, they, they come to a conclusion of what they think we believe. And what I've had to argue since we put out that series is the only thing that I feel that I know or what I've learned so far is that she was murdered. Now, if your suspect is Patsy or John or an intruder or Gary, well, fine. But all I feel that I, I have learned based on the autopsy and other evidence is I, I don't believe it was some type of cover up that now, if you would say there was a murder that took place and the parents tried to cover up through a ransom note, well, okay, fine. But there's still, there was a still a murder that took place. And that's the only thing that I feel that I, I know or have learned and that I could argue. And I think where our thoughts and opinions get a little murky to the listeners is that one, we are different people with, with different thoughts and opinions on most cases, especially this case. Right. 
So my words are not your words. And my words were simply, look, this is a very confusing and complicated case. Right. However, I have a lot of respect for some individuals that work this case hands on. Their own eyeballs, earballs, and hands were on this case, this investigation, evidence that none of us have el- else have seen. Right. We've never been inside the Ramsey home. But those investigators that I respect so much, John Douglas, Lou Smith, John Anderson, Ollie Gray, those guys were pretty damn brilliant at what they did. Were they 100%? Were they perfect? No, that's impossible. But those four guys were really damn good at what they did. And those four guys say, look, the evidence to us suggests that the the intruder theory is most likely correct. None of them are saying 100%. They all say most likely the correct theory. Now, circling back to Gary Oliva, for the intruder theory to be correct, what do we need? What's the ingredients in that sauce? Does Gary check those boxes? Well, we know that he likes to break into homes or at one time did break into buildings. We need someone to have broken into this home. Yeah. A violent individual. We know that he has a history of violence, attempting to choke and, and threatening to kill his own mother. We know that he's a documented without argument pedophile. First degree rape conviction on a seven year old girl. Yeah. Victimology wise, that's not too far from Jean Benet. We need to be able to put this individual in the area. He is in the area. It gets a little convoluted here, Captain, because I've read plenty of articles that do say that he lived 10 to 14 houses away from the Ramseys. Right. What I think we can confirm, what I feel confident in reporting to everyone, is that he had direct ties to a building that was 10 to 14 houses away. I believe that's where he was receiving mail. Yeah. He, he, he was known to have picked up some mail there and keep in mind that church and the church buildings there, there's more than one building, at least two that I've identified. They were feeding some of, they were feeding the homeless and, and he was known to go and eat there. So he, whether or not he lived there is up for debate. Whether or not he even stayed a single night there, up for de- to debate as far as I'm concerned. What is not up for the debate is that he had ties to that building. Right. So you can put him in the area. We know that he's a pedophile. We know that he's broken into homes. We know that he has a history of violence. Those are four things that is required of your intruder, of your suspect. If you like that theory, he checks a lot of boxes. Looking to save big on holiday shopping? Xfinity Mobile has you covered. Now through January 10th, ask how you get a free unlimited intro line for a year when you buy one line of unlimited. Plus, see how you can also get up to $800 off an eligible 5G phone during our Black Friday sale. Now through December 5th, visit XfinityMobile.com to learn more. Restrictions apply. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. Reduce speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage per line. Data thresholds may vary.